baby. I love you. All right, guys, uh, welcome back. This is the um, second pre-recorded lecture for the week of 1020. Um, today, we are going to talk about um, your next convergence test, which is um, really two tests. So let me just jump over here to the dog cam and we'll get rolling, okay? Ah, so this is Mac 2312 lecture. Uh, this is for the 23rd. All right. Um, why am I having some? Ah, it's okay. Uh, so today, we are going to learn the comparison tests. Uh, which come from section 11.4 of the textbook. So you remember last time, we learned the integral test, which under certain conditions said that the series sigma a n summed from one or zero or wherever converges if and only if the integral from one to infinity of f of x dx converges. And here f of n is a n. In other words, you get the function f of x here by replacing the n's here with an x uh, and f of x had to be positive, continuous, and decreasing. Um, so if you haven't watched the video on the integral test, you need to go watch that first and take careful notes. I recapped a little bit of the stuff from Monday in that video. Um, and this video is going to be uh, more or less independent from those results, but still, still you want those handy. Um, in particular, last time we used the integral test to prove uh, the result on P series, which is very similar to the result on P integrals, which is why it showed up in the section on the integral test. And today we'll be making heavy use of that um, because just like P integrals form a nice basis of comparison for other improper integrals, P series form a nice basis of comparison of other series. So um, that's all the recap I'm gonna do today. Let's just jump in. There's two comparison tests. The first, and certainly the easiest to understand is called the direct comparison test. Uh, sometimes you'll see me abbreviate this as DCT. This says if, zero is less than or equal to a n is less than or equal to b n. So you have some sequences. Both of them are positive and the b n's are larger than the a n's. Then if the series sigma b n converges, that implies that the series sigma a n converges. And this sum could be done from zero to infinity or from one to infinity. It really doesn't matter. I'll write zeros. And if the sum of the smaller guy, sigma a n diverges, that implies that the sum of the larger guy, sigma bn, diverges. That's it. Uh, so this is a, a very reasonable, intuitive thing when you think about it. Um, because here, uh, if the bn's are bigger than the an's, then when you add up all the bn's and you get something finite, since each one of the bn's is bigger than the an's and you add up all the bn's, that's finite, then adding up all the an's has to be finite also. 
because if, if an is smaller than bn, then the sum of the ans is smaller than the sum of the bns. If the sum of the bns is finite, that means the sum of the ans is finite. And conversely, if the sum of the ans is infinite, then the sum of the bns has to be infinite as well. The requirement here that everybody be bigger than zero is important. You cannot ignore that. That's a big deal. So let's look at an example or two. Um, the kind of all the analogies that we learned for the comparison theorem uh, with improper integrals carry over here, right? If you fit in a finite box, then you're finite. If an infinite box fits inside you, you're infinite. So I'm not gonna work hard to um, explain those things here because we should be fairly comfy with them from the setting of improper integrals. It's literally the same thing. I'm just rewritten to apply to these new things, series. So a good example here, we could be asked to investigate the convergence of the series S equals sigma natural log of k over k. Here, I'll let k be summed from one to infinity. Again, just to remind you what the sigma notation means, S here, this series, would be the natural log of one over one plus the natural log of two over two plus the natural log of three over three plus the natural log of four over four and so on. Okay. So the question is, does this series converge or diverge? Let's investigate the convergence. And at a glance, certainly not a geometric series. No chance of that. Definitely not multiplying by some fixed constant to go here to here, or here to here, or here to here. Not a telescoping series. There's no way to pull this apart into two other little pieces. This would not be a bad candidate for the integral test. You could do the integral test here. But the integral test is time consuming, it takes forever, kind of sucks, kind of fuck that, right? Like you guys saw how, how long that took in the previous video, each of those problems. So what I'm gonna do here instead is use the direct comparison test. I want to do a direct comparison, which means I need to think of something to compare it against. Now, what I see when I see the natural log of k over k is something that is itself a little bit bigger than one over k. And indeed one over k is positive. So it's true then that if the series sigma one over k diverges, then the series sigma ln k over k would diverge as well. And that's the result. Sigma k from one to infinity one over k is a P series. It's the harmonic series. We saw that as a special example last time. Here, P is equal to one, which is certainly not bigger than one. Thus, it diverges. Hence, by the inequality above, we call it star, give it a name so we can refer back to it. By the inequality star, the larger terms here, the sum of the larger terms diverges as well. Uh, I should say by the inequality star and the direct comparison tests.
Okay. So that's it. Easy as pie, right? The terms in my series are all bigger than the terms in this divergent series. Since ln k over k is bigger than one over k, the sum sigma ln k over k is bigger than the sum sigma one over k. Since the sum sigma one over k is a divergent sum, my sum must also be divergent. That's it. Easy as pie, right? Again, you may want to, when watching these videos, pause, think about things, add in little bits of your own notes. You may want to pause and write down little questions that you'd like to ask in office hours or through email, because we can't stop to ask questions the way we do normally in class. Okay, here's another series that I like a lot for this section. This series, sigma n from two to infinity, one over two to the n plus one is not geometric, it's not telescoping, and it's not a good candidate for the integral test because the function f of x equals one over two to the x plus one, it's not super easy to work with. It's not super easy to integrate. It's not super easy to do anything to. But if you look at the terms of this series, you plug in n equals two, you get one over two to the two, that's four plus one, that's one fifth plus one over two to the three, that's one eighth, or one over eight, uh, and then plus one. Uh, so that would be, sorry, one over nine. And then what's the next power of two after eight? Two to the four is 16, so that's one over 17, and then one over 33, and so on. This is a little bit smaller than one fourth because the denominator is a little bigger. This is a little bit smaller than one eighth because the denominator is a little bit bigger. This is a little bit smaller than one sixteenth, and this is a little bit smaller than one thirty second. So by writing out these terms, or if you like, by thinking about the algebra of the thing here, you can discover, I'm gonna write direct comparison again because I wanna let my reader know what test I'm using. That's so important. You discover the inequality that one over two to the n plus one, like this, is smaller than one over two to the n. And I've written the zero on the left here because of course one over two to the n plus one is a positive thing, right? There's no, nothing negative there. And this is really useful because now my guy, one over two to the n plus one, is squeezed underneath this guy. So moreover, I'll call this inequality star. Moreover, the series sigma n from two to infinity, one over two to the n, that's the same as sigma n from two to infinity, one half to the n, because one to the n is one. This is a geometric series. So my series, the given series here is not geometric, but I can compare it to a geometric series. You see it's off just by a tiny bit, right? The only thing that makes this not geometric is the plus one. Well, that plus one does make him smaller than one half to the n. 
and sigma one half to the n is a geometric series with absolute value of r, oops, sorry, with absolute value of r here being the absolute value of one half, which is one half, and that is less than one. So this series converges. All right, that's great. But I still haven't said what my series does yet. I've just said that this series converges and this series is not my series. My series is the one over two to the n plus one series. And this is where the inequality comes in handy. So now I can say thus, by the inequality, star and the direct comparison test, which I'm going to abbreviate as DCT. I've shown that the terms of my series, one over two to the n plus one, are smaller than the terms of this guy, smaller than the terms of this convergent series. Thus, my series must converge. By the inequality and the series S equals sigma n from two to infinity one over two to the n plus one must also converge. Because term for term, this series is smaller than this series. One over two to the n plus one is smaller than one over two to the n since the series sigma one over two to the n converges, it follows that the series one over two to the n plus one must also converge. That's it, that's the whole job done. And that's the direct comparison test, nothing too hard. You practice with it a little bit, you'll become a master very quickly. The only hard part is coming up with the inequality. To come up with the inequality, you should be thinking about a few things. Um, first, you should come up with a guess. Do I think my series converges or diverges? If I think my series converges, then I should try to squeeze it underneath the terms of another convergent series, as in this example. If I think that my series diverges, then I should try to build an inequality that has my guy on the far right being pushed up from below by something that is divergent or the sum of which is divergent. So in this first example here, let's go back, the natural log of k over k, I said, mm, I think that's a little bigger than one over k. And I know that one over k diverges. Okay, so I think that my series will diverge. So the inequality I'm gonna write down is the terms of my series are a little bit bigger than the terms of the harmonic series. This is a true statement because the natural log is bigger than one. And it's useful because one over K when you sum that is divergent. In this next example, I looked at my series and I said, hmm, one over two to the N plus one. That looks very, very similar to one over two to the N. I know it's just off by a little bit. And in fact, I know it's a little bit smaller than one over two to the n. So I think my series converges. Okay. So I should try to find something a little bit bigger than him, the sum of which is convergent. And again, just thinking of one over two to the n plus one as being close to one over two to the n does the job. This guy's denominator is bigger, so he's smaller overall. And then I know, okay, the sum of this guy, sigma one over two to the n is a convergent geometric series. Therefore, by uh, the direct comparison test, my series is a little bit smaller than a convergent series. If you're smaller than something finite, you must also be finite. That's it. Now, what about
How about this series? Instead of having S equals sigma, let's do it from one this time. Unless doing one over two to the n plus one, I did one over two to the n minus one. This is still very, very similar to the one over two to the n series. The difference is just a tiny little bit, right? I'm subtracting one in the denominator. You can write out the first few terms. One over two to the one minus one, that's one plus. One over two to the two minus one, that's one third plus. One over two to the three minus one, that's one seventh plus. One over two to the four minus one, that's one fifteenth plus. And it really is always a good idea to write out the first few terms because it can give you a feel for what's going on. If this was one plus one half, uh, did I skip a term? One over two to the one. Yeah, no, sorry. If this is one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth and so on, that's a convergent geometric series. That's the one over two to the n series again. Here the denominators are off by a little bit, but in the other direction than they were last time. So one, that's a little bigger than one half. One third, that's a little bigger than one fourth. One seventh, that's a little bigger than one eighth because the denominators are a little smaller. So it's not true that I can squeeze this under the one over two to the n series. This is not smaller than one over two to the n. I can try to write down a direct comparison inequality. I can say, hmm, okay, well, yeah, these terms are positive. It's one over two to the n. And since my denominator is a little smaller, this is the inequality would go this way. This is a true statement, right? One over two to the n is positive. And one over two to the n is a little bit smaller than one over two to the n minus one. Because I've got a smaller denominator here, I'm bigger overall, right? One third is bigger than one fourth. One seventh is bigger than one eighth and one fifteenth is bigger than one sixteenth. But this is not useful. And that comes back to what the direct comparison test says. The direct comparison test says, if the big guy converges, then the small guy converges. And if the small guy diverges, then the big guy diverges. Well, here what I have is that the terms of my series are a little bit bigger than the terms of a convergent series. Sigma one over two to the n is a convergent geometric series. But being bigger than a convergent series doesn't teach me anything. Bigger than divergent, that's divergent. Smaller than convergent, that's convergent. But bigger than convergent doesn't teach me anything. Saying you're bigger than something finite. Oh, well, you could be finite, but you could also still be infinite. It's not enough to say. This is where the other comparison test comes in handy. So what do we do? Well, we're going to introduce a limit comparison test. So we'll come back to this problem. In a minute. Using the limit comparison test. The limit comparison test says if sigma a n and sigma b n could be summed from one or zero or wherever. If you have two infinite series, our series of positive terms 
meaning the ANs themselves and the BNs themselves are all positive. And we'll call the number C is the limit as N goes to infinity of AN over BN is itself positive and finite, that is, C is strictly greater than zero and strictly less than infinity, then sigma n from wherever to infinity of a n and sigma n from zero or wherever to infinity b n converge or diverge together. They do the same thing. That is the limit comparison test. So now we are going to use this on the series above. Take a second to get this in your notes. This is your next comparison test, right? This is a theorem. Label it theorem limit comparison test. Sorry, I didn't write theorem. All right. So here, our original observation that this is very, very close to sigma one over two to the n is still useful. I'm gonna do a limit comparison. Uh, here I choose bn to be one over two to the n. So you have to begin limit comparisons by choosing the bn, choosing the thing you're gonna compare against. Then you calculate c as the limit, n goes to infinity, a n over b n. I recommend always writing this step to tell me that you remember what you're doing. Even if you make a mistake after that, I can give you credit for showing me that you knew. In this case, that would be the limit as n goes to infinity of one over two to the n minus one, that's the a n's, divided by one over two to the n, that's the b n's. And now I can do some algebra. That's the limit as n goes to infinity of two to the n over two to the n minus one. And there's a handful of ways of dealing with this. Um, one of them is L'Hopital's rule, right? So if you look at this, this looks like infinity over infinity at a glance. So I can swap those n's for x's and use L'Hopital's rule. Um, in practice, when we do this, we don't usually write x's for n's. We just differentiate with respect to n. So the derivative of the top is two to the n times the natural log of two. You need to remember how to differentiate two to the x or b to the x in general. And the derivative of the bottom is also two to the n times the natural log of two. You get the minus one, which differentiates to zero. So these do cancel. We just get one and the limit of one is one. So here the number C from the limit comparison test came out to one. So since C equals one is positive and finite, it follows from the limit comparison test that sigma a n, uh, which is sigma one to infinity, one over two to the n minus one, and sigma b n, which is sigma one to infinity, one over two to the n, converge or diverge together. Moreover, C 
sigma one over two to the n, sum from one to infinity, is sigma sum from one to infinity one half to the n, is a convergent geometric series, just like we said before. Because there, the absolute value of r is the absolute value of one half, which is one half. Uh, which is less than one. Thus, by limit comparison, I'll say by LCT, our series, sigma n from one to infinity, one over two to the n minus one, converges also. All right. So the structure of LCT uh, is something that seems to give people a little bit of a hard time. And I want to encourage you to pause the video now, go back and take a look and see if you really understand what we did here. The way LCT works is that you start with some series, sigma an, and you're not sure whether it converges or diverges, but you think it looks a lot like some other series. So you pick bn to be that other thing, right? You think here, my series one over two to the n minus one looks a lot like the series one over two to the n. So I pick bn to be one over two to the n. Once you've chosen the bn, which you think is very similar to your an, you divide them and send n to infinity. So you take the limit as n goes to infinity of an over bn, that's the number c. If the number C, which is the limit of the an over the bn, comes out to be finite and positive, meaning not zero, right? Strictly bigger than zero, strictly less than infinity. If that number comes out to be positive and finite, then the two series do the same thing. The series you started with that you didn't know about does the same thing as the series bn that you chose. So you wanna choose the series bn so that two things are true. First, it's similar to the ANs, similar enough that this limit will come out finite. And also, so that you can say pretty easily whether sigma BN converges or diverges. So here, I felt like the series we were playing with, sigma one over two to the N minus one, was very similar to the series sigma one over two to the N. And yeah, of course, right? One over two to the n minus one is very similar to one over two to the n on its own. So I chose bn to be one over two to the n. That limit came out to one. So I was able to conclude because one is positive and finite that these two series do the same thing. This guy coming out to one or any positive finite number doesn't tell you that either series converge, just tells you that they do the same thing. So then you have to go on to say, also, or moreover, the series of the BNs, sigma one over two to the N is convergent. Why? Well, whatever reasons you know. In this case, I can say that he's convergent because he's a geometric series. And then finally, you can conclude that because C was finite and positive, and because the sigma BNs converged, that the sigma ANs, your series, converged also. All right, take a breath. Maybe pause the video. I'm gonna give you one or two more examples here to play with um, and then, uh, then that will be it. It's hard for me to not say any questions. Um, so yeah, maybe this would be a good time for you to also think about and write down some questions you would like to ask. Make sure you're taking good notes and you know, put a little star, write in some, some questions that you would have asked if this was a regular class lecture. And you can ask those through email can ask those in office hours, um, or you could always wait until I come back and ask them in person in our next class, but I don't want you to wait that long. The limit comparison test is actually the most powerful convergence test you're gonna learn all semester. It's not the last one. I got three more for you after this, um, but it's the strongest one. All right.
Um, actually. Yeah, let's say investigate the convergence of sigma from one to infinity, the nth root of two minus one. This is a sneaky sum bitch. Uh, your first thought might be like test for divergence. Maybe as n goes to infinity. I want to remind you what that looks like. So you should always be running this in your head right away. It's an easy thing to do. Here, the limit as n goes to infinity of the ans is the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of two minus one, that's lim n to infinity two to the one over n minus one, that's two to the zero minus one, which is zero. And remember with the TFD, if this limit wasn't zero, we could say, oh, right away the series diverges. But since the limit is zero, this is inconclusive. Now uh, this is clearly not geometric, right? This is not some number all raised to the N. No hope of a telescoping series. I don't think I know how to integrate the nth root of two or the xth root of two, like integrate two to the one over x, maybe, but it's gonna be tricky, I'm not sure. So I don't wanna do an integral test. And there's no obvious direct comparison. If you think about the rate of growth of two to the one over n, try to think about the derivative of two to the one over n. That fella, that fella's exponential, so it'll be proportional to himself, but then by the chain rule, you would get a, a factor of the derivative of one over n. So I'm gonna do a limit comparison here and I'm gonna choose, and this is a hard one. I wouldn't expect you to see this right away. I'm gonna choose Bn to be one over n. So then C is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n, which is two to the one over n minus one, all divided by one over n. I know that the top and bottom both go to zero here, right? The top goes to zero. That's what I just did in, in my TFD. So this looks like zero over zero. So I can use L'Hopital's rule. I like to put a little LH over the equal sign when I use L'Hopital's rule to let my reader know that I'm using L'Hopital's rule. And I take derivatives top and bottom. The derivative of two to the one over n minus one, well, the minus one will differentiate to zero. Two to the one over n differentiates to two to the one over n times the derivative of one over n, which is negative one over n squared. And downstairs, one over n itself differentiates to negative one over n squared. Cancel, cancel and you get the limit as n goes to infinity of two to the one over n, that's two to the zero, which is one. So again here, c is one. Since c equal one is positive and finite, the series sigma nth root of two minus one summed from one to infinity does the same thing as sigma n from one to infinity one over n, which we know diverges. As a P series. 
because P there is equal to one, which is not bigger than one. Therefore, my series sigma n equals one to infinity nth root of two minus one must also diverge by LCT. This is a genuinely hard problem to attack if you don't know what to do. Even if I gave you this problem and told you it's a limit comparison test, even if I gave this problem to your typical second or third year graduate student and told them it was a limit comparison test, most of them would still struggle with this some bitch because the choice of BN here is very hard. It's very hard to look at two to the one over N and say he must grow at about the same speed as one over N itself. Very, very hard, but it's true. So it makes for a fun example. It's a fun example because it's a tricky problem that the limit comparison test is able to handle very quickly. One of the reasons I like this example is because it exemplifies what makes LCT hard. What makes LCT hard is the creativity in the step here at the very, very beginning. You have to choose what you're gonna compare against. And it's not like direct comparison where you can use normal inequality tricks to get there. You just have to think, what is the essential behavior of my series? And uh, because this is an extra tricky example, I wanna show you one more. Maybe let's peruse the textbook. There's actually two more that I'd like to show you if we have time, I think we do. So classic examples. Oh yeah, let's do something like that. All right, yeah, we'll do something that's not out of control hard. Um, and then I'm gonna show you a few special ones. So this is a typical limit comparison problem about the difficulty of most exam problems. I'm going to investigate the convergence of sigma n from one to infinity uh, n over the square root of n to the five plus one. Uh, and the plus one here is not in the exponent. I want to make that clear. Underneath the radical there is n to the five plus one. So I claim that this is a good candidate for limit comparison. You could run the test for divergence. It would be inconclusive. You could maybe attempt the integral test here, although I don't see an easy way to integrate x over the square root of x to the 5 plus 1. Um, a direct comparison might not be impossible, but I don't see one right away. What I do see is that a n here, which is n over the square root of n to the five plus one. For very, very large n, the plus one doesn't really matter. One billion versus one billion and one. Do I really care about the one? No. This is very, very similar to n over the square root of n to the five. And that can be simplified quite a bit. That's n over n to the five halves, which is one over n to the three halves. So I'm going to choose bn to be one over n to the three halves. Now I need to compute 
C is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over b n, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of n over the square root of n to the 5 plus 1 divided by 1 over n to the 3 halves. And now I flip and multiply. And I get lim n to infinity. The end of the 3 halves is going to come upstairs. n times n to the 3 halves is my numerator. And downstairs here, I just have the square root of n to the 5 plus 1. And this is lim n to infinity n to the 5 halves divided by square root n to the 5 plus 1. Now, the fastest growing term here, the numerator is n to the 5 halves, and the denominator is like almost n to the 5 halves. It's just got this plus 1. So if I divide top and bottom, I renormalize by dividing top and bottom by n to the 5 halves. I'll get 1 upstairs, and downstairs I'll have the square root of n to the 5 plus 1 times 1 over n to the 5 halves. The 1 over n to the 5 halves is the square root of 1 over n to the 5. And then I can mash those square roots together. So 5 halves is the square is n to the 5 under a square root. And I get 1 over the square root of 1 plus 1 over n to the 5. You just distribute. So 1 over n to the 5 times n to the 5 is 1. 1 over n to the 5 times 1 is 1 over n to the 5. This is 1 over the square root of 1 plus 0, which is 1. Now, since c equals 1 is positive and finite, the two series, sigma n equals 1 to infinity, n over the square root of n to the 5 plus 1, converges or diverges together with sigma 1 over n to the 3 halves. Moreover, the series sigma n from 1 to infinity 1 over n to the 3 halves is a convergent p series. Here, p is equal to 3 halves, which is bigger than 1. Thus, by LCT, the series sigma n from 1 to infinity n over the square root of n to the 5 plus 1 converges also. And that's it. So this is a very typical limit comparison type problem where you've got an algebraic function of n as your a n. It's not nice enough to do a direct comparison. It's not easy enough to integrate to use the integral test. And it doesn't fail the test for divergence, so you can't use that. So instead, you use a limit comparison. Take a quick look at how we figured out what to compare against. That sort of logic is really useful here. At this step, I knew that the series converged. Everything else is just proving it. But from here, 
when I said, oh, okay, well, if n is big, then I can basically ignore the one. So this is a lot like n over the square root of n to the five, and that's the same as one over n to the three halves. At that moment, I knew that this series converged because I knew that my sequence a n is basically one over n to the three halves. Not exactly. They don't spit out the same numbers, but the numbers they spit out are like the same size. Very, very close. And I know that sigma one over n to the three halves, if you sum this, that's a convergent p-series. So at this first step where I figured out how to choose bn, I could tell already that the series converged. But then we had to go through all of this work to make the logic tie together and to conclude for sure that the series did converge. Again, this is about an exam level problem. All right, I'm going to do one more example and then I'll let you guys go. This next example is one of my favorites and something like it often shows up on an exam, on exam two or on the final. It has to do with trig functions. So the same sort of thing. Investigate the convergence of sigma n from one to infinity sine of, let's do one over n squared. Now back in Calc 1, there's a section called linear approximation and differentials. Depending on who you took Calc 1 with, it may have been a really important section, may have never been touched. But one of the results is that we know for small x, i.e. for x close to zero, that sine of x is very, very close to x itself. It's because the tangent line to the graph f of x equals sine x at zero is the line y equals x. I may even draw in a little picture here, although it's not necessary for this problem at all. Okay, here's the sine function at zero. Here's zero. Here's the line y equals x. Very, very close to each other, right? All right, if n is big, then one over n squared is close to zero. So sine of one over n squared is very, very close to the one over n squared itself. I'm just plugging in one over n squared for x here basically. So for this guy, I'm going to run a limit comparison. And I'm going to choose bn to be 1 over n squared, because I think my shit looks a lot like 1 over n squared. The sine of 1 over n squared for big values of n is very, very close to 1 over n squared itself. Then c is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over b n, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sine of one over n squared divided by one over n squared itself. Now, of course I can't cancel those. The one over n squared upstairs is trapped inside the sine function. And as n goes to infinity, the top goes to the sine of zero which is zero, and the bottom goes to zero. So this looks like sine zero over zero, which is zero over zero. So I can use L'Hopital's rule. So by L'Hopital's rule, this is equivalent to the limit as n goes to infinity of the derivative of the top 
which is the cosine of one over n squared times the derivative of one over n squared, which I'll just write as one over n squared primed, divided by the derivative of one over n squared, or one over n squared primed. So I can cancel, cancel, and you get lim n to infinity cos one over n squared, that's cos zero, which is one. So again, here C is one. Since C equals one is positive and finite, the two series sigma n from one to infinity sine of one over n squared and sigma n from one to infinity one over n squared itself converge or diverge together. Hence, because sigma one over n squared is a convergent p-series, sigma sine one over n squared, sorry, it's a habit leaving those off, sine one over n squared converges also. And that's it. So limit comparison is an exceptionally powerful tool, but it requires creativity. You have to be creative, or at least somewhat clever in coming up with the thing to compare against. Direct comparison test also requires a certain amount of creativity because you have to come up with an inequality. Sometimes the inequalities you come up with for your direct comparison turn out to point in a way that's not useful, like showing you that your series is smaller than a divergent series, not useful, or showing you that your series is bigger than a convergent series, not useful. In those cases, and in some other cases like these, where there's no obvious way to come up with a direct comparison, you should try to limit compare. And the way you choose your BNs is by using whatever you know to figure out the asymptotic, that's the word, asymptotic behavior of the function in your series or the sequence in your series. So in this example, I knew that sine of one over n squared is very, very similar to one over n squared itself. And that came from this fact. In the previous example, I know that adding one to n to the five doesn't really change n to the five by a whole lot. So, okay, I ignore the one and then that gave me something to compare against. In the example before that, I know that two to the one over n has a derivative that involves the derivative of one over n by the chain rule. So I chose to compare against one over n. In each of these cases, it requires a little bit of creativity, a little bit of thinking hard. So you should read the section in the textbook, look at all the examples and solve as many problems as you can. The homework is a minimal problem set. It's not meant to be everything you should ever care about doing. And certainly it's not enough to make you a master of this stuff. This material is hard, right? Between Monday's lecture, the integral test lecture, and this one, you guys are knees deep in some scary shit right now, and I acknowledge that. So you need to be working very, very hard, and I will conversely be working very, very hard to help you. Um, if you are stuck on something, send me a Canvas message, let me know, and I'll do my best to get back to you right away. Come to office hours. If you're scared about something, if you're having a trouble, uh, troubles with some of these concepts, come see me. Um, I'm going to do my best to introduce, introduce this stuff to you very gently on Monday, but, um, but I know that no matter how gentle or perfect an introduction is, you're still going to be in the soup until you practice with it quite a bit. So we both need to work hard. Um, I'll do my part and you guys do your part and everything will be okay. Uh, that's where I'm going to leave you for today. So I hope that you guys have a lovely weekend. Presumably you're watching this sometime around Friday. Um, if you, again, are stuck on anything, don't hesitate to reach out for help. I will be back in town by Monday. Um, my flight returns back to Florida Sunday evening. Um, 
So I will have a regular class for you guys again next Monday. But yeah, that is it. Um, next time, sorry, next time we're going to pick up talking about um, absolute convergence, alternating series, and the root and ratio test. Those will be our last two tests. Um, and I'll talk about those things with you guys next Monday. And then we'll be pretty much ready for exam two. So exam two will probably be the Monday after that. Um, but yeah, that is it. Take care, guys.